She was okay. also awarded postdoctoral fellowship from MIT, that is Manchester, Manchester Institute of Technology. She is also president and co-founder of RoboHub and an executive trustee of AlHub, that is two non-profit organizations that bring together experts in robotics research, startups, business, and education from across the globe. As an expert in science communication with 10 years of experience, Sabine Hurt Ma'am is often invited to discuss the future of robotics and AI, including in the journal Nature, at the European Parliament, and at the Royal Society. Her work has also been featured in mainstream media, including BBC, CNN, Guardian, The Economist, TEDx, Wired, and New Scientist. She has taught over 2,000 students in robotics, bio-inspired artificial intelligence, engineering mathematics, math data modeling, and programming. So having this excellent and diverse profile of yours, like we are extremely grateful to have you as our today's speaker. So looking forward to an insightful talk. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction and for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here and it's nice that we can do things virtually. Uh, it makes it a bit easier to, to travel. So I'm very grateful uh, to be meeting all of you. So I'm Sabine Howard. I'm an associate professor of swarm engineering. And today I wanted to tell you about my work, engineering swarms for people, trying to get these swarms, whether they're tiny <clears throat> robots for cancer treatment or larger robots for things like logistics um, to those who need it, trying to get them out of the lab and into the real world. And my source of inspiration for swarming is this flock of birds. So if you look at them, they can do these beautiful complex dances in the sky. And there's many features that are useful for engineering. So for example, if you keep adding birds to the flock, the flock can continue to fly so they can scale to huge numbers. If a bird falls to the ground, the whole flock doesn't crash. And so they're robust to individual failure and together they can do more than any individual bird. So for example, they're better at avoiding predators as a flock than as a little individual bird. So there's many features that we get for free that are useful for engineering, adaptability, robustness, scalability, and doing more than the sum of the parts. So the reason they can do this is not because there's a leader bird telling every bird what to do, it's because every bird reacts to their local environment and through following a simple set of rules, you give rise to these group behaviors. This is what we call self-organization. And you see examples of, of self-organization, of swarming everywhere in nature. It could be birds, it could be ants as they create a trail to your picnic table. It could be bees when they make decisions about their next nest site, or it could be our ability to grow fully functioning human shapes just from a couple cells. Those are all examples of self-organization of swarming. Now, as a swarm engineer myself, the puzzle that I need to solve is often, you know what group behavior you want. You might want flocking or creating trails or making decisions or growing functional shapes, but you don't know what rules to put on the individuals so that the collective does what you want. So cracking that, that challenge, how you design the individuals and their local interactions is what we do as swarm engineers. So we do that using two techniques, really. One technique is bioinspiration. So biologists have studied birds and ants and bees and cells and can give us rules that we adapt and then put on artificial systems like robots. And, um, that works great when there is a behavior that you've seen in nature and you have someone who's studied that behavior. But very often you're given a desired swarm behavior, say um, collective motion, and you don't know what the rules should be and you don't have an inspiration. And in that case, you need to explore. So exploring could be um, a student on, on a computer simulator guessing the rules and then checking in simulation if the swarm emerges, or increasingly 
we use machine learning to automatically discover the rules for swarming. So let me give you an example of a bio-inspired behavior I made when I was a PhD student over at EPFL in Switzerland. And here what you're seeing is 10 autonomous drones and their GPS trajectories. And here they're flocking. You see it's messy. And then you get these circles. And that's what we predicted would emerge. They're following three rules of flocking, which are quite simple. Every robot is attracted to its neighbor and that makes sure that the swarm stays as a group. Every robot is also repulsed from its neighbors and that uh, allows them to not collide. Uh, and then the robots try to align their heading. So with those three rules, just looking at their local environment, you get these, these dances in the sky, a little bit like the birds that you saw before. So th that was fun um, during my PhD, but in my mind, swarms needed to work in much larger numbers. I thought 10, even though it was exciting, was not a big enough swarm. And so I spent three years at a laboratory uh, at MIT that made nanoparticles for cancer treatment. And these nanoparticles are really, really nanometer sized, um, much smaller than the width of, of, a, of a human hair. And because of their size, when you inject them in the bloodstream, they're quite good at staying in the bloodstream, except in these tumor environments, certain types of tumors where the vessels are leaky. And then these particles leak out into the tumor tissue. And so that makes them interesting vehicles to deliver drugs or treatments to these tumor tissues. And these particles, they work in, in the 10 to the power 13. Team. So that's a huge number that got me excited. And on top of that, these particles came in different sizes, in different shapes. Uh, Sangeeta Bhatia's lab at MIT could make them with different charges. You could change the material and activate these particles with light or magnetic fields. And you could decorate these particles in a way that would allow them to stick to receptors on cancer cells. Uh, you could also load them with a drug that you could release to treat those specific cells. So actually you had many design mechanisms. You could change their size, their charge, their coating, their material, uh, what you put inside of them. And depending on how you change those designs, how you turn those knobs, you get different collective behaviors when you put 10 to the power 13 in the tissue. So we built a lot of models. And if you're wondering where the robots are, once we dive into the nano world, we're gonna come back to the robots. But we started you know, just thinking about even at the nano world, what makes for a useful question? And it turns out that they have many questions, but for example, just changing the size of the particle and how sticky it is entirely changes where these particles go in a tumor tissue. And bioengineers thought that a sticky particle was great because it would leak out of a vessel, stick to cancer cells, the cancer cells would eat those particles up and then that would kill the cancer cells. Um, turns out when you do the simulations of, of the collective behavior of those particles, well, those particles are so good that they all stick to the same cells when they leave the vessel and never go deep into the tumor tissue which actually is a bad behavior in terms of treating the tumor. So it just goes to show that even though you might think one individual particle is very good, the collective uh, might have a very different behavior. And we do lots of simulations to wrap our head around this. And I won't go into detail, but if our goal is to kill 20 cells deep, uh, that would be dark red on this graph. And most particles, if you change their size or you change their stickiness, do not kill 20 cells. And you can just zoom in here and see that this particular particle only killed one cell. This one was really good. And so just those two changes entirely change what the collective do. And nowadays we're able to create much more sophisticated simulations, which are higher precision. And we can do little tumors on a chip in the lab. So this is actually under a microscope uh, in, in our team, looking at real nanoparticles, which are green and blue, penetrating a little tumor uh, um, on a, on a chip. So we're wrapping our head around how to model these nanoswarms a little bit better. 
And indeed, increasingly, we use machine learning so that if you, if you design a tumor in simulation or you take a measurement, then you can basically grow a tumor in simulation, carve out pieces of the tumor and try to treat those pieces of the tumor until you find the right nanoparticle that does that process really well. And so this mechanism of automatic optimization of drugs for a given disease scenario is something that we've been pushing in the last uh, couple of years. So we also designed a game so that more people could help us design nanoparticles. And in that game, we showed them cancer cells and also healthy cells, because otherwise the solution is to always treat all the basically dump loads of drug on the tumor, which you don't want because that would cause side effects. Um, we showed them that you could change the dosage and the treatment time. You could combine particles, so get particles that work together. You could change the size of the particle, which changes its speed. Some of these cells had a coding, and then you could have a particle which also had a coding that would stick to the cell uh, with a certain strength. You could load the particle, and then you could make a smart material where if you activate the particle, it releases something in the environment. And then you could have particles that self-assemble or disassemble, which speeds up or slows down the particle. So even though they're not flying robots in that you can't program them because they don't have a computer on board, you can change their body. And depending on how you change that, that particle can sense its environment. It can act on its environment by releasing something. That thing it releases can trigger another particle. So now you have communication and actually you can have them speed up or slow down, which although it's not very precise control gives you a way to control their motion. And um, we had, we had 150,000 simulations from around the world. This is what the simulator looked like. This is one particle, for example, that was sticky and didn't go deep, but you can quickly change those designs and see what the behavior is at the level of the game. And then you can make cleverer particles that communicate and do things a little bit differently. We actually played our game ourselves to come up with new rules. And here what you're seeing is a trail between a vessel and one point in the environment a little bit like ants create trails to your picnic table and it uses really simple rules. So we're starting to see these more swarmy behaviors that we see in the animal and in the robotics world, even at the nano uh, scale. So the problem with the nano world is that it's quite challenging to engineer. You need chemists to make the right particle. And the same is true for if you're trying to engineer bacteria or, or mammalian cells or bigger particles called microparticles, they're all challenging to engineer. And so we've created this, this robotic system called the dome that allows us to zap light patterns on little micro swarms and then see what's happening with a camera and then change what light patterns we zap them. And those light patterns are thousands of pixels where each pixel is the size of, of approximately a cell. So we can control these swarms using light. And here what I'm showing you is a little algae, a real one. And using our system, we're projecting light. So here we're projecting blue on these little agents and we're pretending they're communicating. So this little algae is sending a message to this one, to this one, and you can see the message propagate through that swarm. Here we have little algae depositing light trails. And so you can see those white trails that come behind them, which is something that ants do. They deposit little chemical trails behind them. And you can see it interacts with other ones. And here we're actually controlling their motion by starting and stopping them. And so we're using this new <clears throat> swarm playground as a way to control tiny swarms. And we think this could be helpful to control biofilms. So bacterial infections, what if we could zap the right bacteria at the right time to disrupt these infections? We think it could be useful in the case of cancer to zap again the right cells so that you get uh, an interesting or useful treatment of cancer cells. And we think it could be interesting to pattern new functional materials. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I mentioned that after this dive into the nano micro world, I would bring you back to robots. And the reason I look at the nano micro world is I think this changed the way we think about robots. So if you design a robot to plant seeds on a farm, well, you would typically make a tractor that zigzags 
<clears throat> through the farm and plant seeds one after the other. But if you think in the same way as nano and microsystems, you might create 100,000 little robot seeds that are just little biodegradable bubbles and zip through the field and plant themselves. So it's a very different way of thinking about um, robotic systems that work in huge numbers of very simple agents. And some of these principles work. So you saw before that trail made um, with nanoparticles. Well, those same rules work on robots. I actually have a bunch of these robots on my desk. Let me see if I can get one. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> I can't find them. But in this box, I've got a bunch of little robots. They're all coin sized. And, and those are the robots that you see here. They, they vibrate to move around, so they're not very precise. They can communicate within 10 centimeters and they can sense light in their environment. So here you're seeing us release them. They do random walks. They're looking for this second robot. And when they find that robot, they stop and emit a signal. And you see these trails that form back to the source. And this is really simple rules, local motion, uh, random motion. And you can find the nearest object. You can avoid obstacles, really simple behavior that gives you trail formation. Here you're looking at 400 of these real robots and they're sharing information blue and red, and they're trying to decide whether blue or red is better. Blue is better. That's the decision we want the swarm to make. And you can see, let's start over here. Okay, now it's mostly blue. So it starts blue and red, and over time it converges to blue. And again, really simple local messages, random motion, and yet we really robustly can achieve a consensus. Here, what you're seeing is our ability, again, using large numbers of very simple robots to grow shapes. In this case, it's inspired from the patterning in zebrafish and zebras or, or um, in other animals inspired from Alan Turing. So you see these spots on our swarm and those spots basically guide the growth of little limbs, these protrusions. And it turns out you can chop these limbs off and they regrow or you can split the swarm and itself heals so again, you get a lot for free with very simple behaviors if you have enough robots uh, operating. And this is just one of our latest ones, looking at pattern formation using a swarm of, of up to 300 robots. You can see they can nicely form these shapes. So in this case, we, we basically <clears throat> had large numbers of very simple robots still achieving complex behaviors. And it's worth wondering what this would look like in the real world. Well, I, Let's say you wanted to use, you know, hundreds of these robots to monitor the environment, to sense a chemical. Well, you would probably make them hop, maybe would make them jump around that area, that field, so they could navigate. Actually, if you had enough of them, maybe five or six jumps would be enough for that robot to do the job. But we don't want to be spreading robots in the environment. And so we also need to think of ways in which we can make these these robots biodegradable. So this is a jumping robot um, designed by Julian uh, Hurd, and it has these little latches. You preload it, you can coat it with a paint that changes color depending on what you're sensing. And when it rains or when you put robot uh, water on the robot, those latches dissolve and the robot can jump a certain number of times. So we're thinking differently again about these large numbers of simple robots. So a lot of that was bio-inspired. And I mentioned also exploration. And in the case of exploration, well, we need to, you know, our robots might be more sophisticated and very often we use machine learning to come up with rules. So here, what you're seeing is another one of our swarms. And these robots have GPUs on board. So they have much more intelligence than the simple robots that you saw before. And because they have GPUs, we can do machine learning on them, which is, it's called artificial evolution. If you'd like, I'm happy to answer that. And in 15 minutes, they go from not knowing how to push this Frisbee to the side of the arena to being able to push the Frisbee really well. So that's an example where we don't tell them what to do. They learn what to do in 15 minutes and they can do that because they're a little bit more clever. And the thing that we evolve is called a behavior tree. This is what the control of the robot looks like. And we like these trees because we can read them. 
So unlike neural networks, which are sometimes difficult to understand, we can read the behavior of the robot and understand them. Okay, so I feel like we're at a stage in robotics in swarms where we can make all sorts of robot hardware, we can design algorithms, and now we need to make these swarms uh, enter the real world for people. So we designed an escape room before COVID um, where people could come and they were locked in the room and they had to escape from this room by solving swarm puzzles and learning about swarming. And after that uh, escape, after 40 minutes or so, we asked them what swarms could be useful for. And they had all these great ideas, cleaning the ocean, you know, um, medical applications, um, pollination, so lots of search and rescue, lots of areas where they could be useful. And actually we do a lot of communication around <clears throat> robotics and AI in general through two charities that I run. <coughs> Excuse me. We also started asking users what they thought swarms could be useful for. So we asked people who work in logistics, we asked people people um, who inspect bridges, and we asked firefighters if they thought swarms could be useful for them. And the good news um, is, is that there's, there's a scientific method to do this, so we know how to ask these questions, and many of them were positive. So they thought swarms would be useful in specific areas of their work, um, um, but so this is the important thing, but they wanted to know that the swarm was trustworthy, that it was safe, that they would be able to use it easily. So I think it was really positive because they weren't scared or worried about the swarm. They thought it would be useful for them as long as it was designed really well. And so this notion of how you control swarms is something that we've been exploring. What would a supervisor of a swarm look like, and actually we've been automatically designing these supervisors. I'll skip through this, but here what you're seeing is a swarm that we're deploying to search a building. And we can see what the supervisor is telling the swarm to do. First, it tells it to scatter, then it tells it to go Northeast, then it tells it to go Southwest. So we're starting to understand what rules we might put in place to control the swarm and to even test it in complex environments. So here what you see is the robot lab, the real footprint of the robot lab in Bristol. And here you can see the behavior of the supervisor that's telling the swarm what to do uh, at certain points in time. And you can see it looks kind of funny in the way it deploys, but with, with not so many commands, we get them through this complex building. We've also started wondering how we can make swarms work in human settings. So this is a new swarm by Marahan, and it's basically a, a screen on wheels. And we're using this to help humans make decisions. So we're thinking about how humans and robots can work together to share opinions, have good discussions. And recently we tested this in a, in a big shopping mall in Bristol, um, asking people about how we could fight climate change. And they would put their opinion on the robots and their opinions would live on during the day, would travel um, to, to inform other people who came by. We have a project looking at how we can design robot swarms to inspect the mouth of basking sharks. And that's to understand what the structures are made of. And this is with biologists. So here, it's not biology helping robots, it's robots helping biology. And we also have a project with a company, uh, Wind Racers and Distributed Avionics to think about how we can design very big drones and in particular swarms of these drones to do things like carry um, aid or to extinguish forest fires. So um, there our group is thinking about what algorithms we would use and how we would build a swarm operator and the digital twin that makes this type of work possible. So, um, just one, one last bit, and then I think, I think I'll hand over. The other thing that we've really been pushing in the real world is, is the use of swarms for logistics. So here, what you're looking at is the dots for distributed organization and transport system. And we really think that there's, there's an unmet need. There's many people who might use robots who just don't have a robot that they can use out of the box in a simple way. 
So big companies like Amazon or Ocado can invest in infrastructure. They can invest in the research to make the right robot for them. But most places like small retail, warehouse, like pop-up warehouses, places that change and are messy won't have a robot for them. And so what we're trying to design with swarms is, is robots that are usable out of the box because they, they're easy to scale. There's zero scaling efforts, zero setup, zero training. <clears throat> and the reason that works is because they can understand their local environment. So this is our latest robot called the Dot. It has, an, uh, it has um, loads of sensors, really good battery, it goes fast. Um, it has uh, GPUs, it has laser time of flight sensors, cameras, um, and all, uh, yeah, basically this is, this is sort of all the latest thing that we've built. And here you see them picking up uh, some boxes in the new arena that we've built for them. We've got 20 of these robots. And we recently ran an international competition where the teams uh, had to come up with solutions to move boxes as fast as possible. And so we gave them a really realistic simulator so they could test that. And that's what we were judging them on. And it turns out that really simple algorithms with random walks, again, a little bit like what I showed you before, can get these boxes organized really quite fast. So we think some of the principles that we had around swarm robotics in the simple sense will also work for areas like logistics. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's a blog and a website about, about the competition. Um, is it okay if I speak to two more minutes? Uh, yeah, yeah, ma'am, it's completely fine. Okay, good, thank you. Um, but it takes people thinking differently about robots. So let me give you a little example. So imagine a cloakroom. So a cloakroom is, is you're, you're at a conference or at an airport or wherever, and you, you have a jacket that you want to leave at the cloakroom. Well, if you wanted a robot swarm to do this, typically you would imagine that someone would come and make a map of the cloakroom, give that to a central computer. That central computer would be um, posted there and a human would come with their jacket and ask the central computer to pick up their jacket. And then that central computer would, would say, okay, you robot, you have to navigate in this way, come and pick up the jacket. And then it would direct that robot to a specific spot in that cloakroom and remember where that jacket was. So that's the way most multi-robot systems work. They're centralized. Um, that requires a map. It requires the environment to not change. It requires really good communication between everything. What I think a swarm would look differently is that if you set this up as a swarm, you would just put lines on the floor to tell the robots, this is your cloakroom. You wouldn't give them a map. Um, a human would come with a jacket and deposit it in any of the, of the boxes that's nearby and a robot would, nearby would pick up that box and the human would scan a little code on the box to remember where their jacket was. That box could be deposited anywhere in the cloakroom. We don't know, we don't care basically where it goes. And then when the human comes back, they could stop anywhere. And with their app on their phone, they could say, please find my jacket. And because there's enough robots in that environment, there's always going to be a robot near that jacket. And so they can quickly look around like we would do, pick up the jacket and bring it back to the user. So there's no memory, no map. Uh, you do need communication between the robots, but that can propagate. And so that's just a very different way of thinking about what a swarm would be. So I think there, there is, we're at a stage where swarms do make sense if we can make it happen. And it's not just making it happen, it's also about making them trustworthy and safe so that the users do want to know to use them. And I'm happy to tell you more about that if you're interested. I have a couple slides at the end still, but I wanted to say that this is super cross-disciplinary. So my teams are come from all sorts of backgrounds in engineering and life sciences and the social sciences. So robotics is a very big, family. Um, and I also wanted to mention, because they mentioned careers in this talk, that there's a couple MSCs um, that we have that link to this. So I, I just started a new biorobotics MSC that's launching this year that is about life sciences helping robotics, robotics helping life sciences so that we can solve global challenges. There's one in robotics, which is shared with the University of West of England that's broader 
And then there's one in aerial robotics um, based at the University of Bristol. And if you're interested in the Bristol Robotics Laboratory, I'd suggest you, you have a look because we cover all areas of robotics. And actually, if you go to BRL Conference 2021, there's a bunch of videos that we all recorded last week of what everyone is working on in the lab. So I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for giving me a, the extra couple minutes so that I could wrap that up. Yeah. So, yeah, so basically it was like extremely grateful talk and um, we are really like many of us uh, didn't know like what exactly uh, Swam Robotics was and uh, by this talk we were now like pretty much uh, equipped with what exactly Swam Robotics is and what research is going on in this field. So moving forward to the question and answer session. So uh, the very first question we have is, uh, could you go deeper into the algorithm that you had implemented on drones in EPFL based on attraction and repulsion? Sure. So we actually did a lot of different algorithms on those drones. I, I only showed one of them. So that flocking algorithm, what it's based on Craig Reynolds flocking, if you want to look that up. And every robot, so they have a GPS on board and they have Wi-Fi, same Wi-Fi you would have in your computer. And they're basically calculating their local um, position to their neighbors. And they use that to calculate three vectors. One vector is the attraction vector. So they're attracted um, to the center of mass of their neighbors. And that just allows them to basically come together. They're also repulsed from every one of their neighbors. And then they align their heading to their neighbors. So that results in three vectors on the robots that they add up. And that's what the robot applies as its next velocity command. In that particular video, you saw they were all circling a point in zero, zero, um, which is because we added a fourth rule, which is a migration rule to point in the direction of that point, because we didn't want the flock to fly away. Yeah, right. Um... The next question we have is like, do swarm robots uh, get feedback related to the pattern they are forming? If yes, then how? Oh, that's a great question. Um, they don't always, very often the pattern emerges without the robots having feedback that that pattern is emerging. So for example, in, in you didn't really see this very well, but the 350 robots that had spot, colored spots emerge and then they would grow limbs. Those spots emerged as a result of very simple exchanges between the robots, but the robots are not aware at all that those patterns are emerging. All they know that is that they've changed state and now they're in a dot or now they're not in a dot, but they don't actually know that their neighbors are also in a dot. So very often uh, in swarms, the pattern emerges without that being actively controlled for. But that being said, um, increasingly we want that feedback because we want the robots to know that they're doing the right thing as a swarm, especially if we want to deploy them in the real world. And that's a research question is how does the swarm know that its group behavior is doing the right thing, given that all it sees is the local information. So that's exactly that's exactly some of the things that some of my PhD students are working on. It's a great question. Yeah. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, why is information sharing among the robots necessary? Won't making them collision resistant and providing them constraints and goals through a global computer achieve a similar result? So, so I think there's there's um, two questions. There is why is local information? I think it's why is local information better than global information? Is is the way I understand that that question? Yeah, the first question is like why is information sharing among the robots necessary? And mm -hmm. the next part is won't making them collision resistant and providing them constraints through a global computer achieve a similar result? Yeah. So, um, okay, so a couple, a couple answers to that. So local information for swarms can take many different forms. It could be just local sensing of your environment and seeing your nearby robots and how far they are. It could be active communication through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, whatever it is that you have. And it could also be communication through the environment. So ants and termites, the way they signal to each other is by depositing information in the environment that can then be sensed by other agents in that system. So we usually use those three forms of information. 
Now, the interesting thing, the reason we, we go for local versus global is it, it'll depend on the application. Sometimes global makes a lot of sense and a global computer can tightly control the parameters of a system because they know what's happening at every point in time and um, they should be able to manage that if they have enough computation and communication feeding in. Where swarms make sense is when you need scale, when you need large numbers, for example, because every time, if, if you're only relying on your local neighborhood, the complexity doesn't increase of your problem because you're only interacting with five robots, even though there might be 100,000 robots within that environment. Whereas 100,000 robots feeding into a central computer would not, would not scale and that centralized approach would break down. So I think there's one, one aspect of just the ability to scale with swarms, the robustness, because if that central computer crashes, you essentially lose your whole your whole behavior, whereas in swarms that doesn't happen. Uh, although that's that's a bit of a simplification, it does also you can have you know interesting failures with swarms. Um, and then I think this notion of out of the boxness, the messiness. I think it's really hard to plan through a central system in a messy world. Whereas I think we can really us as humans we react all the time locally to our messy world. And if you offload that messiness to the individual is sometimes somehow you can manage the complexity of the whole. So yeah, it's, but it'll depend. Sometimes centralization makes much more sense. Yes, right. Uh, the next question is, could you talk about underwater swarm robotics and how one would go about establishing communication between individual robots since underwater wireless communication is more challenging? Yeah, exactly. Oh, you guys, you all have wonderful questions. Um, it's really hard. We just started this project, actually. Uh, we, well, we have two projects, one that's finishing and one that's starting with underwater robots. The first one, my PhD student, Elliot Scott, uh, worked with biologists to study fish and to see how fish sense neighboring fish using their lateral line sensors. So it's basically flow receptors um, so that they could get, figure out where they were with respect to other fish. So because it's challenging to do communication and sensing underwaters, we're looking at fish and what they're doing. And he built a little artificial sensor that we're putting now on a robot fish to see if we can use that. Um, the, for, the, for the basking shark project, that's just starting. And the way we're doing that is by cheating. So we're having basically, we're thinking of little um, floating buoys kind of at the surface and then camera systems underwater that we can move around. Um, so that the comms stay on on the surface so that we avoid the issues with communication underwater. But you're very right. That is a big challenge with underwater swarms. Yes, right. OK, uh, the next question is, uh, why are people actually considering about the safety of swarm robotic systems? They are noob robots, right? Why are they considering what? Safety of swarm robots. Oh, safety of swarm robots. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that, I mean, so we have two projects on this right now, one on trustworthy swarms and one on, on swarm security. And there's a couple challenges. So one is you could check the individual and check that you're happy that the individual robot is working really well, but the emergent behavior might be very different. So you also need to check the emergent behavior of the swarm and that it's doing the right thing. They're also a little bit hard to predict because of this decentralization. So you need to build confidence that your swarm is going to do the right thing at the right time in the right environment. So there's something about verification. And then there's something about um, the information you get out of a swarm. So in that cloakroom scenario, you'd expect if you were the user to maybe get a map of where everyone's jacket is, right? That might reassure you that the system is working. But actually, when you bring your jacket to a cloakroom and it's a human cloakroom, you, all the human tells you is, thank you for your number. I'm going to go look for that jacket. And then they go and look for the jacket and bring it back. So, you know, what, what will be what will we be happy with with a swarm? Because the swarm operates more like the humans. But do we how do we get this information in a way that build, makes it safe and trust or trustworthy? And then there's just a, a you know, a cybersecurity issue, which is if all these robots are networked, um, you know, what security do you need in place so that you can't inject an, a bad actor within that swarm? And then that swarm might behave differently than what, what their whole swarm was programmed to do. So understanding what you put in place to detect when a fault has arrived in the swarm is also what we're looking for. So 
Um, one of my students, Sue, Sue Lee, is, is basically modeling what the robots are doing in her environment and checking if it looks like they're behaving. So it's it's open question, really. Some swarms, you know, if you make them biodegradable and small, maybe maybe they're they're safe by design. So we can also be clever about how we design them up front. Yeah, got it. Um, the next question is. Uh, what was the purpose of AR tag in the robots equipped with GPU example? Yeah, so so in, what was the purpose of the, um, I mean, so so that was a toy scenario. They were moving a Frisbee from one side, uh, from the middle of the arena to one side of the environment. What they were doing with their GPUs is basically uh, running a form of artificial evolution. All that means is that we initialize random programs um, in simulation on the robots. And we check what the swarm does as a result of those random programs. And then we rank them based on a score. And the score had to do with how well we could move the Frisbee. And we take the top scoring programs and we have them reproduce, which just means that we mix them and we change some things, which is our form of mutation. And so we take those new programs, test them again, rank them, and then generate new programs, test them again, rank them again. Um, and so generation after generation, we get better and better, better programs. So part of this is happening on the robots really, really fast because we have GPUs. So they can do the simulation and iteration really fast over two minutes. Then they can try their best controller and then they can do it again for two minutes and then try their best controller. So in 15 minutes, you have this back and forth between basically evolving something on their GPUs, testing it, evolving, testing it. Yeah, it's a right. form of reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the next question is, what kind of problems are better solved through a centralized approach as opposed to using swarms? I think swarms are really great when you have scale, when you have, uh, as in you need big areas that you just can't do easily with it with a centralized approach or with few numbers of robots. Um, I think swarms make sense when you have messiness and the, necess the necess necessity to, to adapt and scale and be robust. So th those areas that I mentioned, the small, the, the retail shops, the pop-up warehouses, um, you could think of a, you know, a quick food distribution center that you need to pot, that you need to set up. The robot swarms, they'll operate through, through potentially, um, you know, some form of, of, of basic random motion. They'll be able to you know, look around and see what's happening in their environment, pick up the right box and bring it to the right place. But they might not be as, as fast as if you'd really, really optimize that system for a specific warehouse. So I think it's a trade-off between um, the zeros, the, the, you know, the zero scalability, zero uh, training, zero um, setup time, zero infrastructure, and the performance. So if, if your focus is max performance only, then maybe a centralized approach and makes sense. But if your focus is those that adaptability and the scalability and robustness, then, then I think swarms ha have the potential to work. But we have to we have to demonstrate that. This is me uh, from with my swarm hat on. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, moving forward to the next question. Uh, how are the control systems employed in swarm robots uh, different from those employed in classical robots? Um, well, that's interesting. I would say they're very reactive. So they're very much sensor, a bit of control, and then actuation. We don't have much planning going on sometimes, although that's changing as the robots get more and more capable, even in swarms. Um, so, so it's very much about, about reactive controllers. Um, and these reactive controllers could be neural networks, they could be behavior trees, they could be state machines, they could be, you know, any, whatever form of, of controller you like um, that sort of has that, that di direct sense to, to, to act loop um, would work. Um, um, we're currently thinking of, of controllers that are also maybe more verifiable. So what are the structures that make these these systems a little bit easier to verify. Um, the other thing I'd say is that the controllers are often simple in swarms, but that is also changing as these robots become more capable. Um, so on those little coin-sized robots, a controller is a couple of lines of code. Um, it's basically look at your neighbors and do something about, about that information that you've received. Um, the, the logistics robots, the dots, those because they've got five cameras and they've got, you know, LIDAR, the, the laser, um, 
laser time of flight and because they've got GPUs, now you've got image processing, you've got, I'm gonna plan a little bit to go under my box. So you've got a mix of, of this planning at a very local level um, and, and the reactivity we have at the, at the higher level of the rules. Yes, right. Yeah, the next question is, uh, slowly there is an emerging need of aerial and ground robots to work on harmony. So what is your take on that? To work on? Harmony. On, on harmony? Yeah. Can you give an example? Sorry, I'm just not, I'm not understanding you. Uh, basically, or, uh, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Like slowly there is an emerging need of aerial and ground robots to work in harmony. So what is your take in that? Take on that. In harmony, okay, in harmony, I get it, I get it. Thank you, sorry, that was my fault. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so for example, so, so there was a really cool competition um, at the European Robotics Leap on Search and Rescue. And, they, and there they had aerial ground and water robots that were all coordinating in a, in a Fukushima-like scenario. Um, even in the area of, of logistics, it's, it's interesting to sort of think about how you'd pair them. So if, if you think about, um, you know, our robots moving boxes, those are two dimensional. And, and really we probably need 3D to be able to make best use of that space. So there's, there's probably gonna be an element of coordination in how we do that. If you think of logistics at a much larger scale, um, you know, drone delivery can only get you so far and then you need something else to happen uh, on the ground to be able to bring the things uh, where they need to go or to reload those aircraft. So I think increasingly we'll see ecosystems of robots. So it's not just ground and, and, and air, it's, it's a, it's, a family of robots that do different things that need to interact for something to be done. Um, so I think that's a really good, a, a good question. We haven't done that much of ground and aerial at the same time. Yeah, uh, the next question is, can nanoscale swarms be repaired or is it not required only? If needs to be repaired, then how it is done? Yeah, great question. So the nanoparticle systems or even the micro robots tend to be single use. Huh? So they'll, they'll break down in some form at the end of it and then be cleared by the body. Um, so, and that's one big question is where do, they, where do they end up and how do you clear them? So there's always a question about how do you test for toxicity and actually in the nanoparticle world because those go through medical approval, FDA approval, for example. In the US, there's good mechanisms to test all of those things. So we haven't made that's really interesting. In the nanoscale, you don't really make them reusable. Um, the ones that we're testing in, in a dish, um, we're thinking of ways you self-assemble and disassemble and form different patterns. So there you could start thinking of, of the superstructures being, being repairable because they're made out, out of lots of controllable nano or micro agents. So I think there there's, an, there's a notion of repairability that's kind of neat. Yeah, we haven't looked into that, that's a good idea. We have looked into it with the, you know, with the, the, the coin ones that form shapes and we split them and they self-repair. And those mechanisms are really inspired from what happens at the cellular level. So those, there's no reason those mechanisms went in theory, in theory work. Yeah, okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, for, a particular, for a particular industry problem, uh, how do you come up with what minimum functions required for each member of the swarm? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We're, we're doing that exercise now. We're doing specification of the swarm for the logistics um, application. So, um, and also through our use case design. So, and when we speak to the users, we basically ask them, we tell them what swarms are because they won't know what swarms are. And then we'll ask them, where do you think this could be useful for you? Where do you think it wouldn't be useful? And how do you want it to work? It's really early days in terms of building that know-how up in swarm robotics, because I'd say we're just starting to get these out of the lab, um, but that's how we do it. We basically talk to lots of people of potential users to ask them, ask them what would be useful, and that helps us set in place the specifications. Um, at the same time, we're also building up what we think would work, because we need, increasingly, we need these demos. So the robots that you saw lifting boxes were currently playing around with, with scenarios that look a little bit more user-friendly. Um, just to show them videos of real robots picking up your jacket or doing something like that so that they can imagine it. But um, I think it's not quite clear yet how those, what, what the specs, the specifications are for these. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is: Recently, there is a lot of research going on multi-agent reinforcement learning. So, how does it differ from swarm robotics? As at the end, we are just coordinating between the agents. Um, so, so that's a good question. I think there is an overlap between those two communities, and we 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 do consider ourselves a form of multi-agent system. Um, I think multi-agent reinforcement learning also what well, looks at agents beyond robotics. Uh, and so I think it's sort of just a subcategory of that field. And a lot of the learnings can be used as well in robotics. Very often where things fall down is just the spatially, the spatiality of our robots and the real constraints that we have about where they are and who they communicate with at what point in time. And so we're very often just limited through the, that sheer physicality of the robot system compared to some more abstract multi-agent systems. Uh, but we learn a lot from that crowd. So, so I think that's, there's definitely a really nice overlap there. Yeah, right. So uh, that's it for the questions from the public, uh, from the audience. So a general question, like, uh, since this is the industry series and we all are students here. So what, accord what according to you, uh, would you suggest like uh, the quality or the experience or path that, we, uh, that you feel is necessary? to build a successful career in robotics and swarm robotics in uh, specific? Yeah, it's interesting because when I started um, my, my master's, I did computer science originally in Switzerland and I went to, to um, Pitts to Carnegie Mellon for a year and I did a lot of robot competitions and they had these little robot football competitions. And I thought, oh, I, I'm going to do robotics as a, as a PhD. And I didn't think that was a career yet. I thought that was just a really cool thing. You know, I had to go into academia because I wanted to do something really fun. And so I went to do a PhD because I thought that's how I get to do robots. And by the time I finished my PhD with the flying robots, I thought, oh, well, there's no industry that's going to hire me yet with flying robots. And 10 years later down, there's drones everywhere and all of that. And now I feel like I'm at a stage where swarms were you know, I can, he I can hear industry bubbling up and knocking at our door. Um, we, we get a lot of interest because people see that you can make one, two robots work, but they need many robots to work for their applications. And so now Swarms is coming back to the forefront. And again, I feel like we're at a stage where things that felt a little bit science fiction, you know, you wait five, 10 years and it's the industry. Um, so I guess my, my advice is not good advice. Uh, it's... it's um, I, I've just always gone for things that I thought were really exciting and were up and coming and they did become up and coming, you know, for the, you know, a couple of years down the line. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what, what my advice would be, but, but I basically followed the things that I thought were really exciting and, and that, that worked out so far. Um, yeah, I think in terms of robotics, um, there is, there is huge interest right now because it's becoming a reality. And it's just the right stage. And I, I like how we're introducing robotics because we're thinking about these trustworthiness and safety and, and trying to get the users involved from the start. And, and I'm hoping that allows us to build it up in a responsible way. And so I think that's also just kind of learning from how you design technology. I think that's also a, a good way to think about it is we need lots of different skills to get it right. And so don't feel like you're not a roboticist um, or a swarm. No one's a swarm roboticist until they do it. Um, because you don't feel like you exactly fit that box because we need everyone uh, everyone to pitch in. Yeah, true that. Uh, like we have one more question from the audience. Uh, could there be any system that could break the swarm patterns, like the one that could be used with locusts? Oh, with locusts? Um, yeah. The, the insects? Yeah, yeah. Or, or low cost? L-O-C-U-S-T, the insects, locust. Okay. Oh, that's really, I think that would be a great application of, of swarms. We, my, I teach a course called Bio-Inspired AI, and it's, it, it's basically a startup competition. At the end, the students pitch a startup idea. And one of the winning teams this year did a, a swarm of drones to monitor locusts um, to automatically, they didn't do it. It was an idea, right? It was the pitch. Um, but to monitor locust populations and try to mitigate mitigate against them. Um, so I think I think those are the types of applications where there's sheer scale of the problem. And so to address that, it, it wouldn't make sense to think about some of these technologies. But we would need we need, we would need more expertise from those who are living that to help understand uh, what what we could do. Mm, yeah. Okay. So coming to the end of the event or the talk. So. Um, 
I, on behalf of uh, Institute Technical Council, like uh, we all are extremely grateful for this insightful talk and uh, the question and answer session. So uh, let's conclude the talk. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. It was great connecting to you. Yeah. Right. Well, feel free to connect. Bye. Yes. Thank you, ma'am.